Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining this Deep Impact seminar. I have the lovely Liz Muir here with me. Hi Liz, how are you? Hi, I'm really good Laura, how are you? Happy New Year? Yes, Happy New Year, I'm good, thank you. Um, thank you to everyone who's also joining with us virtually. It's a shame that we can't be with one another in Aviemore, even though we'll probably have lots of snow, um, but we are great that we can still join. And thank you for joining us to this seminar. Um, we are glad that you've joined with us and if you're watching, recorded afterwards we are also glad to have you with us. I would love to introduce our lovely speaker and jump right into today's session which is about race, anti-racism work, words that we have heard a lot of this year but it's really great to just have this conversation in this space together. So I'm joined with Liz Muir who is a qualified probation officer with over a decade, doesn't look like it, of experience <laughs> in the criminal justice system. She is an accredited governance practitioner with experience of supporting organizations across the public, private and third sectors in governance and compliance and delivering training to current and potential board members. Liz currently leads diversity and inclusion at Tier Fund and is one of my colleagues and friends, a global humanitarian aid charity working with a wide range of stakeholders and regularly hosts a number of global sessions facilitating dialogue and spaces to help change hearts and minds. Liz has served at her local church in a number of roles for two decades, including in communications, administration, programmatic work, social justice, and programs for the arts. She is an editor of a number of books written by Dr. Carl George, MBE, and also has published articles in the Birmingham Post on diversity within the co corporate governance space. Hi, Liz, how are you doing? That was very long, I apologise. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. And I've done all of that in just the 21 short years of my life, Laura. I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> it is amazing to know about that. <laughs> we just so I'm really to excited to be here. Well, it's great to have you with us. And this year has undoubtedly been a busy year for you. So thank you for also making the time to do this. Um, and it's great because we are at different ends of the nation. So also it's great to do this virtually. Um, today we are talking about race, anti-racism work, Black Lives Matter will be within that. We're going to think about the church and we as Deep Impact are a conference of youth workers or volunteers in the youth and children's work space in churches. So very, very, very important. But I want to kick off with a question, which is just, why are we having this conversation? Yeah, what a question. Um, so I think 2020 was really a year of reckoning um, in relation to racial, racial justice or racial injustice um, <laughs> that has been perpetrated over centuries. Um, many people think it's just a problem in the United States and it's very much not that way at all. It's a problem around the world and manifests in different ways. In white majority countries, it affects people from black, um, Caribbean, African backgrounds, and people from other ethnic backgrounds, including Asia, etc., the Middle East. Um, and in black majority countries definitely has a different um, feel around tribal and ethnic, ethnic tensions there as well. And so 2020 was a year where when George Floyd was murdered, it was like the whole world was shaken into this awakening of racial injustice is real. Like we, this is not something that slavery was stopped and then everything was okay. And you know, we've had things like in the UK, the Race Relations Act, things like that, and then everything's gone back to normal and everyone's happy and fine and there's no discrimination in society. It's very much alive and, and well. And um, I think the reason we're having this conversation is because one, the season is very current now and it's almost like, um, God, it's, it's weird to say it because somebody died, but God orchestrated this to happen at a time where the, the attention of the entire world was on this moment. Um, and really, I think, spoke to the church and our part in um, bringing, making racial injustice become racial justice and working towards and being anti-racist. And so I think the reason we're having this conversation is the church needs to talk about this. Like, we've been very silent for a very long time um, on this, but from both sides, so I'd like to speak on the behalf of Black Majority Church, not on behalf of, I do not represent all Black Majority Churches. <laughs> But I speak like coming from a black majority church background and then speaking also into like the white majority church scene as well. Like we have to, we have to do more. Um, and so we saw a real uprising with young people leading protests. And so the, the reason that we're here today having this conversation as part of Deep Impact is because young people are the future. They're today and the future. And so we need to be able to 
um, steer them and guide them in a way where they understand the importance of being anti-racist. Um, and I think conversations like this for youth leaders um, and volunteers, and just a massive shout out to anyone who's watching this who's a, who's a church volunteer, like volunteering is so important and so special, so kudos to you. Um, but yeah, it's really important that youth leaders and volunteers get involved in um, anti-racism work and, and be part of the movement to bring about racial justice. So that was a really long answer. <laughs> no, no, I love that. And I especially like the thing that you said about a time as this, like it's so difficult to think that anything bad had to happen for us to end up having this conversation. However, I know that for me personally, I think a lot of other people, this year was a year that social media was a space that we were looking into way more than ever. Totally. Our world has never been more connected virtually. So mm -hmm. actually something that happens a thousand or however many miles away in America, it is so much more relevant here in the UK. So I actually really like the thing that you said, because I think there is this year or last year, you know, being a moment of pause, lockdown, yep. the only way we were getting news was via virtualness. And actually I think it was a year that we had to pay attention. Yep. Um, so yeah, I really like that. But I'd, I'd like to go forward to what you said, which was actually about churches and church spaces, volunteers, youth groups. What role does the church have in anti-racism practice and maybe would you be able to say actually what does anti-racist mean or what does anti-racism mean yeah yeah so let's start with that definition then and um it would be like a loose translation of all the things that I've read and you know um I think that to be anti-racist so if I talk to you um in terms of like making policies or procedural decisions if the decisions that we're making do not take into account the differences in people's background, it's racist. And I know there's a lot of stigma attached to saying to somebody, you are racist, or what you did was racist, or what you said was racist. But actually, that term relates to things being, decisions being made and actions being taken that don't take, take difference into account. And so, for example, in schools, there are things like the um, uniform policy that talk about boys haircuts being like a certain grade um, when actually for a black boy having that grade of a haircut actually is the only way for that black boy to look smart um, and so I know a, a friend personally who campaigns a hairdresser who campaigned because her, her primary age school son was excluded from school for a haircut um, and so that is what it means to be anti-racist. Is this policy going to affect different groups of people differently? Or are we doing this with one lens? And when you're doing something with one lens where there's been one voice in the room, um, people who are who look the same, who think the same, then you, the likelihood is you're gonna come up with something that is racist. And so um, working towards anti-racist practice is um, working in a way that we ensure that we are thinking about how this will impact everyone so it doesn't discriminate against any particular one group um yeah so in relation to the church's role well you know the church has been trailing society for generations we are always i feel a little well I, yeah i feel like we're always 10 steps behind the secular world um and so we have a responsibility first of all god is love so if we are not acting in a way that is loving because love is patient kind it's not selfish it's all of these things that we read in the bible if we are acting and operating in love then there is no way we should be doing things without taking into account how it impacts other people so the church has a real responsibility to step up and lead in this space like there, there should be no better place for people to look to right now than the church for anti-racist practice and for community cohesion but unfortunately it's not the case and so we have to go back to that original mandate that we are all created in the image of God. And so we are supposed to treat people equally. You know, Jesus said, what's the, in the New Testament, it talks about what's the greatest commandment. And Jesus was like, love your neighbor as yourself. And I mean, if you love yourself and that's not transcending to how you treat others, how are you being a follower of Jesus? Um, and if we think about how Jesus was, and this is one of the things that I think I have developed in my spiritual discipline over the last 12 to 18 months, is thinking about being more like Jesus. So in the Bible, we read about Jesus um, always addressing or being with people who were marginalised and oppressed and the people who everybody else shunned away from society, the people who were different. And yet we're living in a world where in, in Christendom, as I sometimes call it, we are not doing the same. Um, I think what was really abhorrent for me to see just this week, um, for those of you who are watching it back, you may not, 
the time might not translate, but this week we saw the um, riots at Capitol Hill in America. Um, and what really, really troubled me was when I saw signs that said things like Jesus saves, like equating the church to that kind of behavior um, is a real challenge for me. And so the church has a great responsibility to really step up and be more like Jesus. And I think in um, thinking about anti-racist work, you know, the Bible is very clear about justice. Um, we need to read that version of the Bible or read the Bible with that lens more than we have been doing. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's absolutely key. And I know exactly what you mean. And even going further back to some of the stuff that's been happening in America, there mm. was Donald Trump going to stand outside of a church, yeah. holding up a Bible. Yeah. <laughs> and I think so many Christians across the world were just thinking, he's not going to do that, is he? He's really not going to do that. And then he does. And I think part of, and I think this is part of being a white Christian, mm. it's me to say, actually, I'm to not disengage with that and say that's the other white Christians, it's to say, yeah. right, they are white Christians just like I'm a white Christian. How do we deal with that? Like, how do we have a conversation about that? Because that's so traumatic yeah. for that to happen. Yeah. So I think we've seen that multiple times this year. Um, I'd also love to ask you something, because this is something sure. that um, has been a personal thing for me. It's been the realisation that Jesus wasn't white. Yeah. And this was very <laughs> apparent, because I think I'd been thinking about it this year, from a few things that people had said but I think it was two weeks before Christmas we brought out our nativity yeah. little ornaments and they were white is there anything you have to say about that or like is that something that you've witnessed or had to speak about before because that's something I've really had a bit of a shock around how much I just accepted that Jesus looked like he could be my dad yeah <laughs> it, yeah it's just, it's such a great point so um, I also grew up with the image of white Jesus and didn't know any different and still I, until I started to get older and when I read the Bible like Jesus was a Jew and I was like if Jesus was a Jew and lived in the Middle East then he probably wasn't like Aryan um, so yeah so it, it's really interesting I think it's it's been a bit of a challenge for the black community and what you've had is a lot of people turn away from faith in this community because of the oppression of white Jesus. And I think that kind of um, comes from slavery and how, you know, slave masters used to use the image of a white Jesus to, you know, um, put slaves into submission and when they were trying to evan evangelicalize them. Um, and so I think that there is, I saw a beautiful image this week, actually. A friend of mine is an Egyptian Coptic Christian and it was Coptic Christmas, I think yesterday or the day before. And um, there was a beautiful image of like a, a Middle Eastern couple, like dressed how they would have been dressed in the Middle East and just holding this beautiful child. And it, it's probably the first image that I've seen where I was like, yeah, now, now I can think about the nativity scene. And I can think about that journey to Bethlehem and I can think of who Jesus really was and who his parents really were, rather than the story that we've been told. And so the, the way in which we've done Christianity has very much been from a white lens, even in our work at TIFF and when we work with other people, like we work with people all across the world. And I remember having a conversation with a colleague of mine, uh, mine around the songs that they chose to sing for like our prayer sessions at work. And the songs are still very much songs that are westernized and not necessarily from their own heritage and their own experience. And so I feel like Christians as a, as a body have a lot of work to do to decolonize our theology. And that goes across what we preach, how we preach our imagery um, our music, it goes across the whole thing. Mm, absolutely, I think you're absolutely right. And yeah, it becomes very apparent when you also start to meet people from other Christian backgrounds. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this is kind of speaking about Christianity in general. And, you know, the church has a big thing, but a lot of people here are really invested in young people, young people specifically in Scotland. But we will also probably get some people with young people elsewhere. Um, why do young people matter in all of this? Yeah. And can I just say as an honorary Scottish person, I, I often get told that my name, Elizabeth Muir, Lizzie Muir, as people call me, sounds very Scottish. So yeah, we'll take you. We'll have you. <laughs> an honorary Scot. I think, um, so 1 Timothy 4 verse 12, and I'm gonna read that, says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Mm. 
And I think that we, I mean, I remember being a young person, obviously I'm only 21. So, you know, I'm still young. <laughs> but I remember um, always having this tension in my church upbringing around the things we were told to do and the things we were trained to believe versus my independent thought. And my independent thought was often um, dampened. And it was like, this is the way that we do things. But young people are the people who are carrying the world right now. So if you think about it, there's a young person out there right now who's gonna be the next prime minister or first minister of Scotland. Who is that person? And how are they being raised? Like what influences, what, what are the voices and values that are raising them? Because if you wanna to move to having like anti-racist societies, um, as well as anti-racist organizations and bodies, then we need to invest in our young people. And so again, I refer back to the protests of last year, that it was really young people who were at the fore of that. They were out um, they were having their voice. And what we've seen across the generations is that um, like we have very diverse friendship groups and exposure now. And not in all cases, because I recognize completely that for some people, they live in white areas. It's not their fault, it's what they were born into. But you know, there's, there's opportunity now with content, with social media, with Netflix, with all these different things. There are other streaming services available. With all, the, with all these different things, um, there's an opportunity to understand different beliefs and values and backgrounds and experiences. And so young people are important as well because some of the greatest revolutions in the Bible or the greatest changes or the saving of nations happened as a result of a young person. If we think about Esther, if we think about Daniel, if we think about Joseph, like the, there's a prayer in Daniel that I pray over my nieces and nephews all the time that God will make them 10 times better than their peers. Daniel was a young man who went into a strange land and managed to change the course of history. Um, and so we can't ever underestimate the impact that young people can have. Um, when we think about climate justice activists, you know, there were young people out there in that space who are changing, like literally challenging world leaders on the world stage. Like we have to invest in our young people. And if we don't take the time to encourage them now to have those diverse views, opinions and thoughts and to include other people and value that inclusivity, then we'll just end up in the same situation in a hundred years time. And so I think we need to open the gates to young people, let them influence what we're doing. Um, yeah, and I just think like young people matter so much. There, there's so much to be learned from young people. And you know, there's another script that says out of the mouth of babies and sucklings, like the amount of times my, I've got one of my nieces is 12. And sometimes she will say things that will really, really challenge me that an adult will be scared to say to me, but actually makes me stop and think. And so young people matter because they have, um, they're courageous, they're brave, they're outspoken, and we really need to tap into that because Jesus was all of those things. Mm. Absolutely. And, you know, I think, and kids have also not had some of the moulding that the rest of us have had. Yeah. We don't have some of those conscious or unconscious biases that have been plugged into us. And I love it when a kid just says something straight and you think, yes. <laughs> Yeah. we need to listen to that or you know kids will say that's not fair and they don't understand why and we're thinking well I know why but you don't know why and if I have to explain this to you I'm explaining why like adults are rubbish but I totally get that and the people watching this seminar and people in this community will be members of churches they will be potentially we have a wide range of people from full-time paid youth workers through to one day a week volunteers like an amazing breadth of people but also these people represent churches mm -hmm. and are potentially staff members of organizations and you know are even staff members of denominations what is their role that a, a youth worker could lead no matter kind of what that role looks like yeah well, there's a couple of roles I think you, you're in a role that you need to you have the opportunity to amplify the voices of people, of young people, but particularly in relation to this conversation, young people from black and other ethnic minority backgrounds. So you have a role to amplify their voices. You have a role to shepherd them. And this is on both sides. You have a role to shepherd those who have experienced racism and the hurt and trauma of racism and to be able to um help them and like to manage their well-being and emotional development and all of that there but you ha also have responsibility and a role and I say responsibility probably more than a role to shepherd um young people into anti-racist practice and policy making and decision making so your role as a shepherd is really important so as a young person you look up to adults around you most of the time 
And so they're looking from and learning from you. So if they aspire to be in leadership, they're going to look back at you and think, I don't know, Laura was my youth leader at church. And this is how Laura thought and what Laura did. And so they learn to model our behavior. And so as a youth leader, you have responsibility to be a shepherd. But again, I come back to being a follower of Jesus, to be a shepherd like Jesus, to, to be willing to leave the 99 for the one. Like you have to have that burden and heart. I think that youth leaders have a responsibility to educate themselves around anti-racist practice. Um, and there, like, there's been such an influx of information like about where you can find content, books, podcasts, films, even if you don't want to read, there's so much out there. Um, you have a responsibility to, to tap into that. Like I said, if you are living in a white community or you go to a church that's majority white, it can be more difficult, but there are ways that you can learn and grow in that space. And I think you have a, a massive responsibility to do that. Um, and please don't rely on black people to, to educate you. It's exhausting for us to have to do that. Um, so yeah, education, I think is, is key. You have responsibility to push for anti-racist practice in your church. And that goes for anything from how you worship, how you interpret scripture in your Bible study, how you preach messages or give the talks on a Sunday. Um, there's a massive responsibility there to, you know, speak, speak up, um, speak up. Um, I think also what you teach and how you teach as a, as a youth leader is really crucial. And I think even outside of an anti, a racism a conversation about racism, really think about how you are allowing young people to influence what you're doing. And that's really, really important. And that really is the message of inclusion. Like, let's listen to other people and take their views into account. Um, think also about the socioeconomic impacts on um, marginalized communities when you are delivering your interventions as youth leaders. So think about things like, I don't know, access to cash for trips that you might put on or access to the internet for sessions when we're doing virtual church and I just think about the different things that could be influencing a young person's engagement it might not necessarily necessarily be because they're difficult or they're trying to um pull away it might be shame attached to um you know issues to do with people living on the poverty line not having access to different things or even not having the clothes that they want to wear when we're back to doing things in person like those things can influence a young person's engagement. So it goes beyond like your programming or your scheduling. It goes beyond all those things to the experience of that person and how much they feel they can interact because of how much they feel that they're included in that. So I think those are a few things that you can do. I think also like really when you are doing your own individual study and practice, like think about like it's a cliche to some extent, but what would Jesus do? Like, if it means you got to wear the bands again, like put the bands on, like <laughs> what, what would Jesus do? And I think it's really, really important to um, reflect on who we are as Christians. Christianity isn't about church on a Sunday. It's not about your youth session. It's not about any of that. It's about being a follower of Jesus. And as John Mark Comer says, I think it's John Ortberg that he quotes in his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hooray to Apprentice Jesus. So as an apprentice of Jesus and as you're trying to apprentice young people to be followers of Jesus, like what would he do? That's brilliant. And actually so many of the things you've just said there as somebody who works with youth, like mm -hmm. some of those ideas are great and brilliant and things I haven't thought about. So thank you for some really practical tips. And, you know, I think personally, one of the things I'd love is I think lots of churches around May time um, June time last year did the equivalent of a black square on social media in their church which was a maybe a panicked one moment of prayer or one moment of something but actually I think now is the time for churches to really think how can we integrate this into the life of the church yeah. and not just a sermon series or one-off prayer event but also I want to plug some of the stuff you've done which is you have done loads of resources through your work at Tear Fund and there are lists and lists and blogs and series and so much that you can search for so even a google of Tear Fund anti-racism work or Black Lives Matter will come up with all of these links so yeah. if anyone here is thinking I don't know where to begin that's a great first step that's a first search um, and we'll find lots of stuff which is amazing but Liz I would love to end with one question for you which is a quite big one but I think it's an important thing as we have now turned into a new year um, and even though this year is looking kind of similar to last year it's, it's important to think of this but um, what's your hope for the future? 
I hope that we raise a generation who see the world and other people in the same way that Jesus did. I really hope that the church will lead um, in this space and that we will repent and reconcile um, and that we will move forward to a time and a space and a place where all we are trying to do is not to control people. It's not to, you know, think about our denominational differences. It is to be a body who personifies Jesus on the earth and who come together um, across the world so that we learn from each other really about what it means to walk out this Christian faith journey and how we can do that in a way where we respect and value difference. You know, Jesus, oh, God created us. Um, he created the difference that we have. And so we can't ignore that difference. And I feel like when we ignore the difference, we are doing a disservice to who God created us to be. We're actually saying to God, we're better than you. We can think more highly than you because this is how we think we should do things. And it goes against the natural order of what he created. And so I think my hope for the future is that we will have a generation who are passionate Jesus followers, who are passionately um, being the hands and feet of Jesus on the earth, which means they are passionately and intentionally reaching out to people who are marginalized and, and amplifying the voices of those who are oppressed. Amen. I could not <laughs> agree more to that. That is amazing. Liz, I just want to thank you on behalf of the Deep Impact Planning team and everyone who was with us virtually. They're all around us. Um, <laughs> and we just want to thank you for your time and for your expertise, but also your experience, just your lived experience and being able to share that with us. Uh, we really appreciate that and want to thank you. So um, no, thank you for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure um, doing this. And yeah, you can connect with me if you need to for any further conversations. But yeah, thank you. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Liz. OK, thank you so much, everyone.